I would like to welcome uh, our, fir our first coach interview, I guess, postseason, uh, the former head coach of Utah State and the Texas Tech Red Raiders, Coach Matt Wells. Coach, how are we doing today, brother? Good. How are you, Tyler? Man, I'm, I'm, I just want to give you a big welcome. It's our, it's our first uh, – we do in all season. We kind of we interview coaches and uh, get a little bit about their story and kind of, you know, peel back the curtain a little bit. I had to tell – I got to tell a story real quick. I know, I know you and I talked about this on the phone. Uh, I actually – and you don't remember, but I met you. It was a very awkward moment for me. Uh, I met you about – this is about three years ago, I think. Um, I had gone down to Dallas to recruit and to see a kid that we were we were recruiting and signing. And, you know, while I was down there, they were like, hey, won't you go by and check on this receiver? I don't remember the kid's name. I don't remember what it was. But he was like, if we didn't get a guy, we were going to try to go in on him. He was kind of a backup guy for us. And I believe he was committed to you at the time <laughs> at Texas Tech. And so I kind of stealthily go in there and I see the kid and then I'm coming out and you're going in. You, so you're the head coach. You're coming into the school with one of your assistants and you were looking at me, gave me the look like, hey, what are you doing here? And uh, so I was like, hey, hey, good to see you. <laughs> you know, just come by, say hello to the coach. I'm, I'm in and out. So uh, I got I got caught trying to be sneaky uh, down there in Dallas by you. So I don't know if you remember that or not, but uh, you, you kind of busted me. So it was a very I do. We made sure me. he was committed real quick once we got into the school. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. It, we never we never pulled the trigger, but I was uh, I, I remember calling uh, Matt Luke on the phone when I got in the, I got in the car. I said I don't think that one's going to be a surprise anymore, boss. I think they, I think we they know we're here. So uh, yeah, that was a funny one. But hey, uh, so I want to tell a little bit about you. So uh, I was I was reading up on you, um, and I didn't realize that your father was a dentist. Yeah. So. Did you, did, when you were a kid, like, did you get in yeah. trouble? Like, if you had a cavity or something, did you get grounded? <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, uh, it's not cracked out, uh, cracked up to what it, what people think. Um, you know, honestly, I did the bare minimum, to be honest with you. I think that cavity stuff, and I can, I'll say this, I'll get ripped by some of my dad's friends probably that are dentists, but I think it's, I think it's a lot of genetics. I really do. You either got it or you don't like my poor wife. I mean, she gets cavities all the time. Um, Coach, you're going to get in trouble. You can't I, I, don't, I mean, that, I think that's, the truth. that's what we're doing on this podcast. We're just, we're keeping it real. Right. Um, I'd be the guy that uh, flossed like the night before, you know, they got okay. all those dentists have those signs. You don't have to floss your teeth, just the ones you want to keep. I've seen that since I was like, two years old. Right. Um, I would floss the night before, like I knew I was getting my teeth clean because that hygienist or him where they were going to try to make you bleed, you know, right. Flossing. And I wanted to do it the night before to kind of get it out of the way. And then the next morning, you know, the lady would say, Oh, Matt, you've been flossing so much. You're not bleeding very much. Well, oh, so you're telling me it's just a big roost this whole time. We've been flossing for no reason. I don't know. I, I never got in trouble because I never really had any cavities. I don't think I really did anything special to, to not have cavities, to be honest with you. Yeah, I get blamed for I get blamed for my kids' cavities now. Like my wife blames me for my kids' cavities because she Genetics. says that I, I let them eat too much junk. Well, yeah, I don't know about that. Because I'm a I'm a Reese cup fiend now. I yeah. I can eat Reese cups all day long. I could eat it, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so my my six year old he he's just like his daddy now he 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 his his if it's like a, have you ever seen Elf the movie Elf yeah yeah so yeah. you know how he likes his sugar that's my six year old yeah sweet tooth I mean, yeah sweet yeah. tooth it's unbelievable if it's not sweet he's not eating it yeah. um so yeah I get blamed for that all right this is a question that when we have coaches on I think is very entertaining I like to just ask a lot of them what is the worst the worst visiting locker room that you had to visit as a coach or a player or whatever. Do you do you have one that just like sticks out in your mind that you're like that that fans have no idea about? Oh man, I going back to the you know when I played at Utah State and and um, coached there for eight years. Man, I'd say I'd say San Jose probably takes the cake. Uh, that's that was pretty bad. Fresno was bad. Uh, little bitty thin lockers like you know remind you of junior high kind of, and then there was a long walk, but. Uh, and then you had to go past the dog pound, which are some great, great fans, awesome fans. I mean, they're passionate about Fresno football, but you know, I'd probably say the worst. Yeah, I'd probably say San Jose, just small, cramped, really, really small. You know, Oklahoma State here in the Big 12, I wouldn't say it's bad, but it's very strategically um, um, 
configured. You, yes, you, I it mean, is. you can't address, it's hard to address it. You can't address the whole team. I've been um, in that one. I haven't address, been in, I never went know, to San Jose or Fresno, but I, I've been to the Oklahoma State one. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's a maze, right? And it's, yeah. it's hard enough to, to even address offense and defense like at halftime making those adjustments, but uh, you definitely can't address the, the whole team. Um, All right, so you were, you were talking about you played at Utah State and coached there with head coach, with assistant coach. You were there a long time. So I got to tell you a funny Utah State story I bet you didn't know. So I don't think you were there at the time. I think it was while you were in between stops. But uh, in 2003, I believe, I was trying to remember, I was at Arkansas State as a GA, and we go out to Utah State to play. We had a good team, and uh, we were building, and, and it was kind of our second year there, and we were coming off of a good season. And we were like 20 or 30-point favorites. Like we were we were supposed to win the game kind of easily. Uh, we go out there, and our kids, you know, we got kids from Arkansas, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. We got all these southern kids, and we're out there late in November, so it's a little cool at first. All right, it's the first, that's the first one. Um, and so we go altitude out there. Altitude factor. What's that? You got altitude factor. Too. Yeah, we didn't tell them anything about the altitude. Yeah, you didn't. We just we didn't you mention that. that. They don't. Yeah. They couldn't even spell altitude. So we we were we were good oh, there. Man. They didn't even know what that was. They thought altitude was something that you flew in in a plane. They had no idea, right? So we we go we go out there. And we get we come out for kickoff, and they do the haka dance right in front of our bench. Okay, our kids. It's the first time I'd ever been on a team where our kids were scared to death. I'm talking about scared to death, and I'm like, what are we doing? And we proceeded to get our teeth kicked in, and we lost. I mean, we were like thirty point favorites, and I think we lost like fifty something to six. I mean, it was embarrassing. We got our our teeth kicked in, and then. <laughs> And then the other thing that happened out there that I think you'll get a kick about this on is, so the, for the fans that don't know, the stand, the fans are right on top of you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking about, I don't know if they've changed it since they, I know they've no. done a lot of renovation there, but I'm talking about yeah. they were on top of you and the benches were like dugouts, right? So the stands actually came over and you sat underneath the benches were underneath. And so it was really tight. And so I was coaching uh, gunners on punt return at that time. Right. Mm -hmm. And back then, those days where you only had like two GAs and like you had to coach things, and now you got staffs of seventy five thousand people, right? <laughs> I hear you. So I'm coaching the gunners, and I'm looking down. I'm about thirty yards away, and the gunner, and this is back in the old days, what we called spread punt, which is what uh, the fans see on Sunday in the NFL, that kind of punt. You right. know, now you see all this rugby stuff, but old school punt. Our gunner gets jammed out of bounds, right? And so he's running down the sideline, which is what you would teach them to do. And they had to get back in, which is, well, you could cheat a little bit and run down the sideline. And so I see the guy coming and I step back, you know, because I'm going to get hit. I'm in the white. And I step back and there was like a 10-year-old ball boy from Utah State that was standing right next to me and I had no idea. And so when I step back, he gets plowed. I'm talking oh, about 10 years old, just gets smoked by the players running by. And uh, it was right before half, and I come off. And I can laugh about this now because I think the kid's okay. I don't think he had any permanent damage. But when we came back on the field, he was sitting on the bench with the ice bag on top of his head, and he had blood trickling down his nose. So, yeah, that was my Utah State experience, Coach. I know you had some better ones. But yeah. uh, I didn't have a great trip out to uh, – yeah. is it Logan, Utah, right? Logan, Utah. Logan, Utah. So, I didn't have a good thing there. All right, so talking about Utah State, as a player, you played quarterback at Utah State back in the day, mm -hmm. and uh, you are, I think you're like four years older than me, so I guess your last year I looked up Young. was like my, my first year in college. So we're getting old, Coach. I've got gray coming in here yeah. and all that stuff. But, yeah, I would too um, if I let it grow. <laughs> let it grow. What was, as a quarterback, do you remember like the hardest hit you took as a quarterback? Huh. Yeah. Because those were back in the day where it wasn't soft. You know, you got, I mean, they, you, you didn't, they, wasn't, they didn't take care of the quarterbacks like they do now. Well, yeah, and we didn't have uh, concussion protocol either, um, which I think is is good. Uh, by yeah. the way, um, shoot, Tyler, as I I remember, um, you know, I remember playing those Colorado State teams in the mid '90s. Um, Sean Moran, Brady Smith, um, God, those two DNs were really good. I think that probably the two that take the cake, though. I remember playing Utah several times and that was Luther Ellis and um, Luther was a couple years older than me and um, Bronzel Miller played on the other side so man you I mean if you slid it you had to slide to Luther you had to put four hands on him 
uh, which left Bronzel Miller in a one-on-one. -on -one. If you were in slide protection, that's that's not usually um, that's a no bueno. A real good, but I would say Luther Ellis got me a couple times. I've teased with Luther over the years. That's why my back is still bad. Um, but I mean that guy, you know, all American, um, long time in the NFL, right? Detroit Lions for a long, yeah. long time. But I'd say those four guys, those those are the names I can still remember. Those names, those guys, uh, especially those two at Colorado State, they were they were good players. Took you're some trying hits to get from those guys. You're trying to get coach to call a little bit more three step in that game. Woo! Yeah, <laughs> empty. Get the ball out. Throw hot, quick. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the football. We'd like to pull the curtain back, but I'm I'm curious because it's really hot right now. And, and as a head coach, you know, I, I ran recruiting, I guess, when this thing came around. So I'm I'm all in it and talking about recruiting. But as a head coach and and being a head coach for so long and really going through this whole development of it. What are your thoughts on the transfer portal? Yeah, yeah. Well, and you, you know, over the last several years, Tyler, you've seen it um, go from graduate transfers right now to an open transfer, uh, immediate eligibility. And um, at Utah State, all the years, uh, we would always hold a couple scholarships and, and benefit from getting some group of five, excuse me, power five transfers to a group of five school that were grad transfers late. And we um, – we took advantage of that. That was the plan here. Um, that was the plan here at um, at Texas Tech when we first started, and we did it with all grad transfers. And then it opens up, and I, I'm for it. I like it. Um, I think it's it's only right for those players to have that. Um, you know, as a coach, it's hard to manage, though. It really is. And I would, I'd like to see. I know a lot of other coaches would too. Maybe maybe there's a little bit of a timeline on it. You know, yeah. Mike, you know, I know yesterday was just the day for underclassmen to declare for the draft. And then I think they've got, what, 48, 72 hours after to be able to pull back out. But something to be able to manage your rosters a little bit better for the for, for coaches. Um, you know, the, the month of December and half of January to me is all it ought to be, you know, time to make that decision. There's been coaching changes, whatever. Um, and then maybe open it up again certainly after spring ball, you know, I right. know May 1st, the deadline this year, but uh, man, that's, that's hard to manage. It's difficult to manage with your initials and especially with COVID with guys coming back and the rosters. And um, I would say everybody's is in flux a little bit and how exactly how many numbers you have, but overall I'm for it. I think it's good um, for those players. Um, and most of the time, I think guys are doing it for the right reasons and, and trying to play and find a place to, to play and have a good college experience, and for that, I'm all for it. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I think that if they can do this, they can they can create that window, right? So at least whether you say that at the end of the semester, uh, to the you know, so all of December basically, in the you know, to January, but then with that, they need to also take signing day, and they need to move it back to February if they do that, because because of how it's killing you know high school recruits. I mean, I agree. It's, it's destroying it. And, you know, uh, last week on the podcast, we talked about there were some early numbers coming out. We're actually going to do a study once the last signing day is over with. But uh, I believe it was a tweet by scoutingohio.com that one of my buddies, uh, Joe Palsick at Western Michigan, showed me at the convention. But, like, he showed the state of Ohio. And every year, Ohio's had between 120 and 150 or so uh, Division One prospects. And this right. year, there's only 66 kids out of Ohio. I mean, that's, yeah, it's less that's than insane. Half. Yeah. And so I think you're going to see that across the country. Um, but, you know, I'm with you, though. But if, I think if they, sh if they shorten the window, and so now these coaches are like, okay, um, now we got to go fill these last spots with high school kids. And then the other thing that I don't know, I don't have an answer for this, so I really haven't um, approached it. But the, the other thing that a lot of people aren't talking about in the portal is how many kids are left in the portal that lose their education. You know, nobody wants to talk about those hot button topics. You know, yeah, right now only about 30% are getting out. That's correct. And, and, and every year it's been 67, 68, 69, 70% every year that it's been in yeah. play. And right. um, the amount of kids that are in it right now, I think I saw something the other day. There's enough kids in the portal right now to, to fully uh, place the starters for 67 of the FBS football teams. Hmm. I mean, that's, yeah. It's nutty, There's nutty. certainly a lot 
you know, you mentioned the the signing day. The other the other part of that answer may be to move it up to, into August and let the the guys that have been committed for a while let them sign. Obviously, there's going to have to be a, an out for them if there's a coaching change or something right. like that. You know, certainly they can redo. You know, go back through it again in December and January and and revisit some of those schools. But um, I just think from a time from a roster management. We got to help the the coaches in terms of that with the time. Maybe there is a signing day early in the signing day in February, but the month of December is flat out crazy right now. Right, and and everybody's like, oh, well, it'll take care of itself, and it really won't. Um, I mean, what do you have? I mean, you've been in coaching for a long time. What do you? What would you guess? Five to seven coaches are really safe every year. You know, there's not that many coaches that are safe. You know, you have to win, and so coaches have to win. They're not going to go. Well, let me go sign this freshman, and then you know you're not, you're going to go portal crazy. I mean, it's it's it is what it is, but it kind of I don't know. They got they have to do something because right now they're killing their product because there's no high school kids coming in, and sooner or later <laughs> the the supply is going to run out because everybody's transferring. So mm-hmm. we'll we'll see where it goes. But all right, so switching gears a little bit, you know, I this this is called home visit, and you know it was one of my favorite parts of being in a home visit, but because uh, I'm a foodie. All right, so, but as a head coach or an assistant, okay, what was the best meal you ever had when you went on a home visit to see a kid? The best. Well, what's, Man, your had a lot. what's your go-to? What are you fired up about when you know it's getting cooked? Well, no, I, I, first of all, you're eating whatever's on the table. Yeah, a lot. You know that, yes, right? Yes, a lot. Um, you're not really making your order, and um, – no, I've had a lot of really, really good meals. I think back, you know, those, a lot of those meals in Utah with the, especially the Polynesian families over in Hawaii, those are, those are hard to beat. Um, well, you know, one night, Keith Patterson and I, long, my D coordinator for the last four years, we, we had a home visit in, um, in central Texas and, uh, man, uh, unbelievable steak grilled, um, roasted salsa because they 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 grilled the peppers and the jalapenos and everything um it was awesome and uh then he dropped me off at my hotel and he kept driving he got um got caught in an ice storm spent the night in his car in a in a (laughs) parking lot that was a sheet of ice outside of austin um i remember that meal because it was really good and it was like the last one i had it seemed like for a day or two there um because we we got snowed iced in um, but a lot of, lot of good meals, Tyler. And so is it, when you're the head coach, is it, is there a lot of, uh, do they come in your office and close the doors or a lot of negotiating to see who gets to recruit to Hawaii? Is there, is there, is there, is there some kind of, I mean, is, there, is there some kind of, hey coach, look now, I, I'm, I'm really good in Hawaii. I mean, who, how do you decide who gets to recruit Hawaii? Well, it, usually you have a guy on staff that either, you know, grew up there, or, you know, at least I did, or, or has connections to the islands and, um, and that kind of deal. The, 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 the part that is funny though, is the position coach is always wanting to go over for the third guy, right? It's oh, not coach, just the area no guy, but the position guy I'm in, I'm in on every trip and you know, it's hard, it's hard to recruit Hawaii. And I know that sounds funny, but the time, um, the distance, uh, red eyes, um, to, to, uh, try to maximize your time. And that's usually what it was. Um, and so the travel part's difficult, certainly not the eating or the fellowship. That's, that, that's the best part. Coach, there's no doubt. If I was on your staff and I was coaching receivers for you on your staff, I would have 47 wide receivers from Hawaii. I don't yeah. know. I mean, in the spring for sure. Now, once we get out of spring, I'd be like, okay, you know, whatever. But in the spring, I'm going to be recruiting 47 receivers in Hawaii. I'm yeah, going to have to make need, a trip. You're going to need that position evaluation. Yeah, I got to go watch them practice, Coach. Yeah, I if know. I don't, you yeah, know, because I, I can't yeah, make a like decision. And I can't make a decision unless I get to go see them practice. Yeah. So we would yeah. have to we'd have to we'd have to do some yeah. negotiating with that on that deal. So that's awesome. All right. So I know you've been you've spent some time on the West Coast, especially we were talking about it earlier uh, in Logan. What is the and you've played all across the North, everywhere else. What is the coldest game? Okay, the coldest game that you you either coached in or you played in in your career. Yeah, I don't I don't have a temperature for you, but. Um... Man, I've been in some some cold ones. The um, humanitarian bowl, Idaho potato bowl, used to be the <laughs> humanitarian bowl. That dates me, doesn't it? Uh, in Boise, early January. You know, we had a January one of those January third or fourth. Um, that That's where the, I the potato bowl was that day. Yeah, in Boise, uh. Um, uh, those were cold. Uh, you know, 
a lot of, uh, you know, Mountain West, those Friday night, late November, 8 o'clock, Friday night ESPN kickoffs. Um, you know, the Mountain West Championship, my first year at Utah State, um, 2013 in Fresno was, was really – in fact, I caught – I was wearing some Gore-Tex pants and caught uh, caught my pants on fire on one of the sideline heaters, and I was talking to the old lineman, and their eyes were down, and I'm like, "Give me your eyes," and one of the old linemen was like, uh, "Coach Wells, your pants are on fire." I was and telling I the story to my son literally oh, yeah. uh, so, either Saturday or Sunday, the Bills and the Patriots game. You know how it was like really cold game. And I was literally telling the story of, you know, I had leggings on underneath uh, yeah. my my khakis, whatever. I don't even remember what, who were to play in or whatever. But I had the same exact thing happen to me where I was coaching in between series and I had my board. And I was sitting down and the heater yeah. was coming right there and I was on the board. And smoke starts coming out from underneath the board because I had it in my lap. And it was my pants, <laughs> my, my khakis were on fire. Yeah. From the yeah. from the jet heater, so yeah, I've, I've been there, done that. That's a scary deal. I was like, whoa, whoa, I, I got, I had some, I, I learned that I still had some quick twitch left. I got moving pretty quick on that one. So, and the equipment guy is mad at me, you know, because I, I think I was at, I don't remember if I was at where we were at, but he was mad at me because like I burned my khakis. I'm like, what are you going to do? I'm just not like I sat there and tried to catch myself on fire, right? But yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's rough. Those, hey, I'm curious about that. It's like, are you like? Low key, kind of upset when you get selected to play in the Idaho Potato Bowl in December and January. I mean, that's got to be like, of all the places that you could go, you're just gonna go freeze your rear end off. Is that is that fire you up? I think it depends on you know. Let's go real talk. It depends on what school you're at and how many bowl games you've been. I know at Utah State when we went back to back years in '11 and '12, um, that was the first two bowl games in quite a while. At Utah yeah. State, you yeah, know, well, very, you didn't really care high. where it was no. at at that point in time. Um, yeah, and so then you know, at that point, the bowl game was like the first weekend in December. Man, those are the best, or not the first weekend in December? Excuse me, the first bowl weekend in December, oh, which yeah. was like the third week right before Christmas. So you came out, you missed recruiting, but you bowl prepped, you played, you came back in the office for a couple of days, and then man, you had your your Christmas break, which was really good as a coach. Um, so those were, I think. You know, I think it just depends on where you're at. And, and um, you know, we were very thankful at that time at Utah State to be invited to a bowl game and, and to go there and, and to win. Um, and so those were, um, those, were, those were good days. Those were good bowls for us. All right. So you're, you're one of the very few I can ask this to. And, um, but as a player at Utah State, you went to the Las Vegas Bowl. Okay. And right. let's don't get you in trouble here with a wife or anything else. I don't want uh, you know, your kids don't need to know anything. Nineteen ninety three, like so the we kids don't. Your, state. Yeah, your kids don't need to know anybody, uh, anything about this. But I was a player too in the bowl game. So here's the question: As a player, was going to the Las Vegas Bowl as fun as it sounds? Yeah, we had a pretty good time. Um, <laughs> Hey, you don't have you don't have to say anything else, Coach. That's all. No, that's I, all you need to know. You know what? I can remember. Those are vivid memories. Our our team hotel was the Excalibur Hotel. Wow. Um, I remember going, uh, and I've seen it the, a couple times. I've been back to Vegas. I've seen the next place, um, and I know you know. Found a found a place that had two dollar tables. I learned how to play blackjack with some of the older players. O'Shea's. We kept going to O'Shea's because it was two dollar tables. Two dollar uh, blackjack. Much money. How about yeah. that? That's you don't see the two dollar tables anymore, Coach. No, uh -uh. no, they they, no, they I, like. I, I doubt O'Shea's has it either. <laughs> yeah, I you know I, I tell people though when I've been out to Vegas a, a few times uh, with my wife and um, I guess we've been two or three times now, but every time we go. I tell people it's actually now in Vegas. It's cheaper to gamble than it is to do anything else because if you go you go to dinner and a show, you're you're out five bills before you even get before you even get cranked <laughs> up. So it's uh, it's actually cheaper just to gamble and eat a free buck and get your free buffet. But uh, it's it's a fun time. All right, so this is another question I'd like to ask you as, as coach. Okay. We like to peel back the curtain a little bit here. All right, I have mine. I'll I'll, I'll admit my new one. Okay, but what TV show? Have you watched or do you watch regularly that if your buddies asked you if you watched it, you would deny it? You would just – to, to your guy friends, like, I don't watch that. What are you talking about? What, what's, what's, your, what's your TV show? And you can blame it on your wife that you have to sit there and watch it with your wife, whatever it is. I, I, I'm about to do that. I'll admit mine in a second. What's your show? 
Well, the one that comes to mind right now, since you just asked it, is is uh, you know lately I've had I've had a little bit more free time on my hands, and I've been around the house a whole lot more. Um, you know, I think she's ready for me to get out, but you know, it, it, she always records and, and I think I'm always scrolling on my phone and then you eventually kind of look at, start looking up and you, you end up watching yeah. it and you're like, what am I watching? I mean, she watches the bachelor all the time and, you know, and so it's sitting there going in the living room or at, you know, at, before we go to bed and it's just. You just happen to peak. Like, That's it. You don't yeah, really watch it. It's a peak, right? No, I know. And I, I would deny it. And now yeah, we're yeah. doing it on a podcast. You're probably recording this thing, and I probably can't deny it now. Hey, you're just peeking. We won't call it watching. Just peeking. You're just, just peeking. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have to admit, I have to admit something. I came home uh, Friday. Uh, our kids they had school shut down here on Friday, so I came home, and my wife was watching this show on Netflix called Cheer. Okay, which is like, yeah, Jim was like, watching uh, it last night. You watched it. Not- no, I didn't watch it. Jim was watching it in the bedroom. I stayed out and watched the Cardinals and the Rams. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it's like a last chance you for cheerleading. And somehow yeah. I got, I'm trying to, you know, I was just trying to be a good husband. That's all I was trying to do. I really wasn't interested. You know, right. I, was just, I was just trying to be a good husband, but yeah, I watched, uh, I watched cheer on Friday with my wife. So um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'll bust myself too while we're at it. So yeah, yeah. it is what it is. All right, so let's let's go back to football a little bit here. So okay. being in the business for, you know, better part of 25 years you've been in and as a player and longer than that, what are kind of your thoughts on NIL and where it's at and where it's heading? What's your thoughts? You know, I'm curious because obviously you've been a head coach and player and coordinator. You've kind of been through every gamut. What's your thoughts? Yeah, first of all, you know, I, th- I think there's a lot of good to it. And I always see the good in, in these things. And I think it's it's good for the players to be able to, um, you know, be compensated um, for some of their talents and their in their abilities, and and I think that that's awesome. Um, I think there's a management part of it with coaches within the locker room and in your building, and in terms of the education piece of it, and it's not going to be equal amongst your team, just like it's the the NFL rosters not paid uh, all the same. Certain positions get paid different, and I think there's some similarities there. I think there's some responsibilities that are taught to the players in terms of their time management and, um, you know, whether it's um, their taxes or anything like that, that now they're responsible for. I thir- certainly think we've seen over the last several months it take of a life of its own um, in terms of some schools and their recruiting and all that. And, and you, you always, those are some unintended maybe consequences of it, but I don't know if it's a consequence or not, Tyler, but, it's here to stay. That train's left the station. I think it's about managing it as a as a head coach and and um, your your team being mature about it and um, guys handling their responsibilities in the right way. And so, um, I'm for it. I really am. I you know the the last year here at Tech, um, I thought our our locker room handled it very very well. And um, I don't think it affects recruiting drastically. Yes, it does a little bit, and there'll be a handful of those cases, I think, uh, you know, but in terms of group of five and power five, I, I think it all is going to work itself out. I'm curious here, um, kind of follow up on this, because you're actually the first head coach we've had on since this rule came to pass. Um, had a bunch in the off season, but are you, were you, or were you worried, I guess is the bigger, bigger question, is it leading up and it, when it first started, were you, were you worried about how like, all right, if your quarterback went and got, I'm a million dollars or whatever your quarterback, because that's who's getting paid, right? The quarterbacks. If your quarterback went and got a big deal, were you worried about how it affected the chemistry inside the locker room? I was. Yeah, yeah. and that's why we addressed it from the from the beginning. And we talked about it, and you talked about how it's just fast forward, you know, for those kids two or three years, that's what it's going to be like if they ever get a chance to go to the NFL. Uh, businesses are like that. You know, the CEOs are making the most, the CFOs on down to the managers and, and, and all of that. And as you, just like in business in the NFL, it all has a certain structure and a certain pay structure. Um, with, the, with the higher pay comes higher responsibilities, and, or excuse me, more responsibilities. And so I think just addressing it and, um, you know, and talking about it, our guys here handle it awesome. 
and and some guys got paid more than others and i think just the reality that that's going to happen but with that comes responsibility yeah i you know it's uh you know just like anything you know I, i'm always i've always been a gray area guy and trying to find the ways to use the rules to you know you got to know the rules to be able to use them to your advantage you know and um does it does it as a head coach did it does it concern you or does it bother you how other teams are using it um really stretching it to the gray area to help them in recruiting does that is that a concern or a bother i think the biggest thing tyler is all coaches want is somewhat of a level playing field in the league that you're in right um, you want it to be the same and um you want the rules to fit for everybody and that's um you know i think that's what most coaches will want yeah and it gets it gets like you know because it's getting, you know, in the southeast, it's like legal cheating. You know, I mean, it's what it's turned into on some, in some aspects. Not everybody, but in some aspects. And and I guess the part that probably bothered me the most I talked about last week was how you got people in the portal that are literally saying going to the highest bidder, you know, and it's just, I, I don't know. It's just you ain't got to say anything on that. I don't want you to say anything on that, but we'll get off of that. But, um, all right, so here we go. You got a free weekend. Okay, some the magic fairy comes down. Had a says, lot of free weekends lately, Tyler. <laughs> hey, hey, it's not all bad. It's not all bad. You, you, it's you right. miss it, but it's it's great. I will yeah. say this: I miss the hell out of coaching. I really do. I miss being. I miss the competition. I miss the competition and the camaraderie more than I do anything uh, with the guys and the coaches. But it's been it's been a really cool thing for me to, to it's it's weird because I've kind of reconnected with my family that I never got a chance to do before. So yeah. uh, that part's been good for me. But yeah, I'm sure I would agree with all thing. that. Same. Yeah. Um, all right. So you got a free weekend. Somebody comes and gets your kids. You got three kids. So somebody comes and keeps your right. kids. Money is not an issue. Money is not an option. It's not on the table. You get to take your wife away for a long three or four day weekend. Where are you going? I'm probably going to Cabo. Cabo. Um, I've never been to it. Cabo. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, weather's always great. <clears throat> golf, good golf, uh, restaurants, the beach. I mean, Edith's, the office, uh, floor farms. Those are those are great places, and um, it's easy to get to. Um, so that's where I'd go. Don't talk it up too much, because my wife listens. She may be having me on the plane to go. I may be writing a check to go to Cabo. So don't 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 talk it up too much, right? No. There's got to be something. Is there a negative down there that I can throw in when she brings us up? Um, no. Come on, no coach. Negatives. You got to help me out a little no, bit. No, come on, man. All right. So all right, <laughs> that's good. All right. So you mentioned it. Are you are you a golfer? I enjoy golfing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. What's our handicap? Uh, the end of last summer, I was a nine. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's, uh, you know, I, I have, I aspire to be a nine. Yeah. I cannot keep a handicap. Yeah. I'm a, uh, if any, and the people that are listening that play with me understand this. Yeah. I, I'm a, I get accused a lot of sandbagging, but I'm really not. I can either, it's every hole that I line up on, I'm a threat to eagle. I'm also a threat to like throw up a snowman real quick. Yeah. I'm not scared of going out of bounds. Yeah. Ball in pocket, you can do that real quick. I can do that. I will because yeah. I swing. I swing very hard at a golf ball. Like yeah. that, that's the whole point of like it's not entertaining to me to lay up. I don't lay yeah. up if I can you see the pin. I'm going up. for it. Yeah, and I don't care. It could be like carry two seventy over water, and I have a three foot landing zone. I'm going to think I can pull that shot off, and then a hundred times out of a hundred, I'm going to be in the water. So that's that's me. So I'm I'm good at scrambles. I'm a I'm a a scramble guy. I'm great at scrambles. Now you may not be able to use about five shots a day, but they're good five good shots. They're they're a good five. Yeah. What's your what's your favorite? If you had to pick one course, what course are you playing on? One course. Pebble's hard to beat. Is it? I'd, I'd, probably, I wish go to, I'd probably go to Pebble Beach if I had one more round. You had one more round, Pebble? Yeah. Have you how many times have you played out there? Um, I don't know. Seven or eight. All right, what's the low, lowest score you've ever shot on a low, lowest Pebble. score ever? 18 holes, at, lowest score. What you got? At Pebble? No, it just in period. Oh, anywhere? Heck, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. Have you, go, have you, have you gone below par before? No. No? Nope. Never yeah, have. I, 70, 77 is mine, so I've never gone below 77. 
So that's what'd you my, shoot on the back nine? What's that? What'd you shoot on the back nine? Thirty nine. I'm just messing with you, man. Yeah, no, I, I remember I went thirty eight, thirty nine. Got seventy seven on the front. No, no, I went thirty eight, thirty nine. I will never forget it. Thirty eight, <laughs> thirty nine. So that was my that was and it was at it was at the university golf course out here at at, at uh, Ole Miss because yeah. and it's built for me. They built that golf course here. At, oh, at, did they? At, yeah, because. You grip it and rip it, and wherever it lands, you can find it. Like, it's wide open. Like, there is yeah. no danger. So, yeah. I may be hitting off the opposite fairway, but grip it, rip it, and go get it. So, I, I, that's my that's my spot. I can go low there. All right. So, besides football, which we all obviously know football, what, what sport do you follow or do you watch besides football, if any? Oh, shoot. I uh, I like all of them. You know, I, I follow basketball. I'm big. You know, I love March Madness. Um, college baseball, especially in Omaha, um, got to go see the Red Raiders play up there a couple uh, summers ago. It was awesome, my son and I. But probably just uh, their sports, following Wyatt around and watching his travel baseball team and and basketball and football. My daughter, my middle my middle child's a competitive gymnast, so um, we're all over the state of Texas in in um, all spring semester watching her um, compete in gymnastics. So. Uh, quite a, we stay busy, but, yeah. but, uh, I would say all of them. My wife would be jealous. My wife was a gymnast. Uh, she was a gymnast at Auburn when we met. And so <clears throat> we had all boys. So she, she never got to do the gymnastics thing, but yeah. it's probably a good thing. The good Lord probably knows what she's doing. Cause she'd probably be tough on them. But, um, yeah, Texas, she says Texas is where it's at in the United States in gymnastics. So it's very she, competitive. Yeah. Yeah. She loves it. All right, so the last football question before we get out of here, but what 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 kind of your thoughts? I'm curious, um, being now that you can probably talk about it a little bit more because you're not a head coach right now, but as a head coach, kind of what are your thoughts on the college football playoff expansion? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm for it. Most most guys are. I, I I'd be for eight. Um, it's really just, I mean, the reality is it's it's one more game. Uh, that's it. And uh, max, uh, what would it be? Fifteen. Yeah. Twelve and. 13. If you go yeah, eight, whatever, if you go eight, you'd have the eight, four, you have four additional games. Okay. But I'm with you. I mean, I don't th- see there's a reason. I've always, I see, I, I said 16 was kind of my number back in like the OFCS days and they won double A by what we called them. Yeah. Um, and that way, everybody, every conference, okay, every conference gets a guy in like they did in the old one double A days. You know, every conference gets a guy in, then you have the six at large. That creates, but I think to do that, you would have to take away one regular season game, right? Yeah, you may have to do that, and then and then how does the that affect the bowls? Um, That's you know those, those bowl right? experiences are really fun for those players, and um, you know we 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 mentioned one that uh, you know that I got to play in, in in college. You remember that experience? It's awesome. I I'm a traditionalist in terms of the bowls. I like that, but I do think there's merit to expanding this thing. Yeah. I just think, you know, it's kind of like that's the I think the cool thing about March Madness is I just think it'd be better whatever they expand it to or 8, 12, 16 doesn't matter. I think the when you create when players have hope at the beginning of the season there's something to really work for, you know, I, I think that's what you get out of March Madness, right? I think that's just a mm-hmm. it's a cool thing. I think it makes you know, we were talking about if you go to 16, like those Tuesday night matching games, you know, they mean something now. You know, people, I think you create more people walk, watching and tuning in right. if it has playoff implications and all that stuff. So, anyway, it is what it is. But, yeah, I, I think it's – are you – do you think uh, on that same topic, does it – do you think we're going to have to have a, like a college football commissioner? We're going to have to have a guy that's in charge of this thing to get this thing rolling. I'm putting you on the spot here. I didn't tell you about this one, but – um, no, do, you, do you think I, we're going to have no. to have a commissioner of college football? Because it seems to me, you know, the more I'm out of it, the more I see it. But every – when you have these college football playoff meetings, you know, the Big 12 has his guy, the SEC's in there, the ACC, and everybody's trying to pull their own agenda and we're not getting anything done. Do you think we need well, a I think in terms of that, if you keep it that simple, Tyler, I mean, one guy can, can help, you know, facilitate discussion, but then somebody's going to have to make a decision at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, what's the best thing for college football? And I think there's a lot of coaches that would be in favor of that proposal. Would you be in favor of a college commissioner as a head coach? Yeah, yeah, I I agree. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I've been I am, but I've never been a head coach, and I don't know. And look, I I tell people all the time, you know, kind of your window and what you do, but as a head coach, you know. Um, and then talking about that, you know, that's a good good segue. So 
when you became a head coach, a lot of people tell you, you know, you, you interview for jobs and you've been an assistant for your whole time. But then it comes that time when you become a head coach for the first time and right. you think you're ready and you think you know everything. But what, what kind of when you became a head coach, like what's one thing that happened that you weren't prepared for that people don't know about that, that you never saw coming? That because I've heard this, I've heard a lot of coaches say, man, you never know until you sit in the chair. Like what's yeah. something that you wasn't really expecting, I guess, is kind of the what I'm getting at when you became a head coach. Yeah, two things come to mind because I just I go back to when I first became a head coach was December of 2012 at Utah State. And, and really, Tyler, all I'd ever, you know, you feel like in this business you were trained and wanted to call ball plays and be an OC for me. Um, and I was that at Utah State. And then, then you have a chance to become a head coach because of the success of your team. Right. And um, someone moving on. And, and that was certainly the case with me. And I remember that first week on the job, uh, I had a player, a linebacker from, um, from Miami. Um, you know, brother was murdered right. um, and was in my office within, I, I don't know, it was the first week, a few days after being head coach. And, um, you know, he was sitting in my office. And um, I haven't had that experience. I didn't have that experience. Um, I've got one brother and um, just sit there and listen. And now all of a sudden you're, you're dealing with that situation. And, and um, really for the first time in my life, um, you learn to really listen. And the one thing that I've always tried to make it a habit as a head coach, especially as a head coach, is to never say to a player, I know what you're going through, unless I'd been through it. And so while that never came out of my mouth that day, just learning to listen and and uh, and try to understand what a young man's going through, you're not – we don't really get trained for that in, as coaches. And I think it's uh, it's an ability that um, is, is um, extremely needed as a head coach. You need that. You need to be able to relate. Um, and part of relating is is just listening. And so in going to that, you know, um, my dad passed away three years ago. This May, it'll be four. Um, and I'll never forget that very next fall in 2018, I had two players within a week lose their dads. And so now that was an opportunity for me to say, I know exactly what you're going through because I'm still going through it. And... Um, and just being there for those guys and, and being there for your players, you, you're, I don't know if you're ever prepared for that and you don't get prepared for that. You know, the other thing is just time. The, the second thing that I think of is just time and, and the conversations that you have to have as a head coach that are, that are very important. Um, you know, um, a veteran coach told me, I've uh, been a head coach for 22 years. He shared with me right after I became a head coach, he said, Matt, you need to understand that now as a head coach, every conversation that you have may not be your most important of the day, but it's a pretty good chance that it's that other person's most important conversation of the day. Um, whether it's an assistant, a player, a, an equipment manager, um, an academic person, um, you know, an administrator, it doesn't matter. And he, and he likened it to remember, he's like, remember when you were an assistant coach and you'd walk by the door of the head coach and you're like, is he in a good mood? Is he in a bad mood? Is it good? To, I got to go talk to him about my wife's doctor's appointment or a child or something I need to miss. And, and you're trying to always find that right moment. And I think people out there can probably understand what I'm saying. And you're like, uh, well, I got to catch him at the right time or the right mood. And, you know, when the, the knock on the door comes and it's, Hey coach, can I have two minutes? It's not two minutes. It's five. And um, coach, you got five minutes, five minutes is, 15 and um, the reality that those are very important conversations and those are times where as a head coach you have to just sit and you have to listen and you have to listen for what they're trying to ask you and and to try what you're trying to solve and how important it is and I think that's one of the biggest things that I learned and was um, you know I think most head coaches aren't ready for that Um, and there's there's nothing you can do to prepare it except when you get in that situation. Man, that's a that's a great, great point. Uh, I've never heard I've never heard anybody say that before, and I've been I've been around some good ones. 
Um, I've never I've never heard anybody say that. That's that is about as good of advice that I've heard in a long time. Um, you know, because you are as an assistant. You know, I, I was telling the story the other day about how you know I was one of uh, one of the guys that worked for me. Uh, it's not public yet, but he just got a uh, SEC head recruiting job, right? And we were talking, and I said, you know, one thing I, I found was, you know, you, there's things that you have to have answers on, right? So the assistants are calling me asking, are we going to go on a player or whatever, right? And then I have to communicate that to the head coach, get the answer, then relay it, because they don't want to talk to the head coach for whatever reason, right? So I actually found it was – I communication improved by me traveling with the head coach on the road because he was sitting next to me the whole day. He didn't have a choice but to answer and talk to me all day. And so I was able to improve communication because I was sitting next to him during the contact period, you know, during the time when decisions are being made. Um, and so I was giving him and talking about, about that. But you're right. You don't realize that but as an assistant and as a running recruiting, you're always like you're trying to figure out, especially when I was with uh, uh, Nick Saban, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out, what kind of mood, you know, and coaches know if you work with Nick, you just don't don't go talk to him before 1030 because he's not in a good mood. So, you, you know, wait to 1030, then you go talk. You, you know those things. And so that's interesting that you say that. So uh, that is great, great advice for head coaches. And I know we have. It's funny you said that day. about assistants. So I've always heard my assistants are like, boy, if you really want to know what's going on in the building, ride around with Matt and recruiting for a day in December or January and listen to the phone calls he takes. You'll, you'll find out what's going on in the building real quick. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, it's, it's nuts. But, Coach, and I, I really appreciate your time. Um, you have – you and you don't know this, but I've had so many coaches uh, reach out to me and and about how – and I, I'm so glad I got a chance to sit down and visit with you about how great of a human being you are. And we like – we like, you know, I'm always a, a proponent of coaches. Uh, you didn't know this, but, you know, several episodes back in the middle of the season when you were having your fun, I – uh, me and my man DJ Elliott went off on your defense. Um, on here, we pull for our coaches. You, you're truly one of the best. You know, everybody that I've talked to, you, I can't find anybody that has anything. Not that I'm looking, but it's all 100% how great of a guy you are, and how good of a players coach you are. And um, by the way, and just so you know, we have this record going now to where all of our everybody that does a show on here, they get like these big time jobs. So maybe <laughs> some of our luck will will, will come over on you. Uh, we, we're like 10 for 10 right now. We, we're, we're on fire right now. So, um, I'll take but it. look, you, you truly are. I mean, everybody, like, you're one of the most respected guys in the business. Um, and I want you to hear that from a coach's standpoint, from an old coach's standpoint. But Thank you. Um, how much uh, you're admired and respected in this business. And I really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate you having me on. And cool deal you're doing here for, for coaches and for college football. And kind of, as you keep saying, uh, pulling back the curtains, um, layers off the onion, whatever. Um, but uh, fun, to, fun to visit with you. Thanks for having me on. You bet.